Great. So again, um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to speak to all of you. Uh, my name is Chris Clues. I am an author and a speaker and I guess an 80s pop culture guy, you could call me. Uh, and I got here kind of in a roundabout way and we're going to talk about that. The one thing I wanted to point out, Faith mentioned in uh, the, the intro that I'm going to do a book giveaway and I will. Around the middle of the presentation, I'm going to do what's called a mixtape quiz. And I'm going to put four cl clues from a movie. And if you know the name of the movie, you're going to want to type it in right away and let Faith know that you know the name of the movie. And the first one to get it right will get a signed book by me, my second book in the series, which is the black cover. Uh, I will tell you that I'm going to sign it so it's worth a dollar less on the street, but it's a free book. So. <laughs> I'm going to just interrupt you for one second, Chris. I want to mute everybody and then I will unmute you. Okay. Can you unmute yourself, Chris? Done. Okay, perfect. Ready? Thank you. Good? Right. Great. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in here. And one of the first things that, uh, little technical issue there. One of the first things, so my, my, my presentation is wax on, wax off. Everything I need to know I learned from 80s pop culture. And it's a very true thing for me because I actually grew up in the 80s, literally from the age of 10 to 19. So I tell everybody that pretty much everything I did for the first time in my life, I did in the 80s. It was certainly an awesome decade for me. and some of the best lessons for our life and our workplace will come from the most unexpected of places, 80s pop culture being one of them. You know, we, we go to certain places and expect to get life lessons and workplace lessons, but I do believe that some of the best ones come when we're not expecting them. And we're gonna go through a lot of those today from both 80s movies and an 80s musician that I hope everybody will know who is very, very iconic. Now, one of the first questions that I guess get is how does one become an 80s pop culture expert? And you'll see me here. I was lucky enough about a year and a half ago to be at an event called NostalgiaCon, and it was an 80s event. And I moderated a panel for a Goonies reunion. And if you know the movie, The Goonies, those two guys right there, Sean Astin and Corey Feldman were one of the main, two main actors in the movie, The Goonies. And then of course, I was also able to uh, moderate an MTV VJ reunion panel, which was really awesome for me because there was a time when MTV actually did play music videos. And I was lucky enough to be around. And just a little trivia, if you don't know, the very first song that played on MTV was Video Killed the Radio Star. And what's really cool about that is it was a band called The Buggles and they were this little new, new wave band and their keyboardist was Hans Zimmer, who is now a famous composer, Oscar winning composer. So it's pretty cool to look back 29, let's see, we're going back 19, 39 years ago and see that Hans Zimmer was a keyboardist in the very first video on MTV and is now an Oscar winning composer. So again, how does one become an 80s pop culture expert? And I said, you have to live through the decade, right? And that means awkward family photos. This was, I don't know how old I was there, but the haircut's really bad and the fake bookshelf in the background. I think we probably did this at Sears. You have members only jackets. Uh, my sister here, she thinks she looks like Gertie, the little girl from ET. I think she looks like ET with the cone shaped head. You spend a lot of time in mall arcades. My game was Galaga. So clearly I got that picture right in front of it. You, 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 at the senior prom, I don't know why, but I cut lines in my hair. And actually the good news is in this picture, they're not painted, which would explain something about me because I did actually color them with permanent magic marker. And apparently that seeps into your head, doesn't come out. So probably explains a lot about me today. And you never really grow out of it. I, I dressed up as Revenge of the Nerds for Halloween uh, two years ago. My friend said, hey, just sit on the couch there and take a yearbook picture. And uh, that was the result. So I did love growing up in the 80s. I obviously still love the 80s. And we're going to do a lot of talking about that today. Now, another thing about becoming an author and a speaker, I spent over 20, almost 25 years in corporate marketing. And I finally made the decision to go out on my own. And there were a few reasons for that. I always felt this pull to kind of do something myself. I waited a little bit longer in life than most people. Uh, I was watching a movie called The Breakfast Club, one of my favorites, and uh, I was kind of having a self-pity party of one. I was actually uh, in a job that I really just didn't like. I wasn't feeling comfortable there. I'm watching the movie. John Bender, uh, Judd, N Judd Nelson's character plays the criminal. He said, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. And I heard this and I kind of sat up and I said, yeah, you know what? I'm in my imperfect place. My screws have fallen out. 
what am I going to do to put them back in? Am I just going to pick up those screws and put them back in exactly the way they were and keep going? Am I going to find some new screws to put in or maybe even find an entirely new door and a set of new screws, which is exactly what I did. I, I just pivoted and changed my career. I did write an article on what the Breakfast Club teaches us about the workplace off of this quote and the idea that prob about problem solving, screws falling out and putting them back in. And people responded and I got a really great response to it. So I, I wrote another article, Ferris Bueller and Work-Life Balance, which we'll talk a little bit about today. And then I proceeded to start writing the books. Now there were two uh, pop culture icons from very different times. So Henry David Thoreau from the 1830s, 1840s, and then we have Johnny Cade from The Outsiders in 1983. Uh, these two guys couldn't be more different, but they were very similar for me and their inspiration to move from the corporate world to actually being an author and a speaker. Now, Henry David Thoreau said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And he said this well before people were sitting in cubicles or working in factories. I mean, this was well before the Industrial Revolution when he said this. And I was in a bit of a quiet desperation. I do love marketing. I have a huge passion for it. I really enjoyed what I did, but I was tired of doing it for someone else. And I wanted to do something for myself. I just wanted to fall in love with what I was doing. And so Johnny Cade and the Outsiders said, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. And I love this line so much that I put it on my coffee mug. And I look at this every single morning to remind me, I left the corporate world at 48 years old. I'm 50 now. So two years ago, I left the corporate world. A lot of people, when they take their entrepreneur journey, they, they start it much earlier than that. And regardless of your age or your station in life, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. And the time is now to go create you. If you find, you know, we all have limited free time. And if you find that free time is being encompassed by the same thing, a hobby, a passion, or an interest, it's taking up all of that very valuable free time you have, maybe it is time to go create you. That's what I did. I found that all of a sudden this writing, this 80s pop culture was taking up all that really valuable free time I had and I decided to do something with it. And so I stand here in front of you today and here I am as an author and a speaker and it's really, really awesome. Now I go back to some of the best lessons for our life and our workplace will come from the most unexpected of places and we're getting ready to get into that right now. I wanna point out one thing, if you're wondering about my background here, there uh, Blockbuster, for all of you that remember Blockbuster, and having to sit at, on a Friday night, you're waiting at the return bin, hoping that somebody is bringing that movie back that you're waiting desperately for. And there's some, there's some romance in that, right? I mean, it's great to have everything at our fingertips today to be able to watch whatever we want at any time. But I do kind of miss that wonder, wondering when I got to Blockbuster, if that movie that I wanted was going to be in, and if somebody, if not, if somebody was gonna bring it while I was there. So I do kind of miss that. This background here, I actually took this picture inside of the last Blockbuster on earth, which is in Bend, Oregon, and is still there today. It's actually an Airbnb now. They do still rent movies, but people can rent it out. And they have a bedroom in there and a kitchen, and you can sit in a Blockbuster overnight and watch movies. It's a really awesome idea. So I took this picture when COVID hit, and I wasn't speaking physically anymore, and I needed a virtual background. I was kind of going through my pictures, trying to find something to fit, and boom, here it was. And I can even walk all the way back here into the shelves, pull something off the shelf, and come back to you guys. So I love this image. It makes me smile every time I'm speaking and I have it behind me. So as we move into the movies, the next, the first movie we're gonna talk about was actually one that you may have rented in a blockbuster. And that movie is The Goonies. So for those of you that don't know The Goonies or maybe haven't seen it in a while, the, the story is pretty simple. It's about these kids here and their town, their neighborhood is going to be uh, taken down by a developer who wants to put bigger houses in a nice golf course. And the kids have no way of stopping their town from being torn down. And so they decide that they're going to go on this treasure hunt. They, they, they hear that there's a treasure that was left by a pirate, one-eyed Willie, in their town years ago. And they are going to go find that treasure because if they can find the treasure, then they can save their town. And off they go, this little band of misfits or outcasts, to go find that treasure and save their town. Now for our particular lesson, we're gonna focus on two of the characters, Chunk and Sloth, two of my favorites. Now Chunk uh, up here in the, uh, pirate, in the kind of black pirate hat, well, they both have black pirate hats on, but he's got the flowered shirt. Chunk is actually a very successful entertainment attorney now in LA. So he's done very well for himself behind the camera. And Sloth was played by Ted Matuzak, 
who was a Oakland Raiders football player, played with Lal Alzado, if you remember that name, and unfortunately passed away long ago, but this was such a great role. Now the two of them meet because Sloth is chained up in the basement of a restaurant simply because of the way he looks. His family puts him down there. Chunk gets caught by the family of bandits and he's put down into the basement with Sloth. So here they are together. They couldn't be more different. Sloth's down there because he's got a cone-shaped head, ears that wiggle, crooked eyes, missing teeth, and as Chunk so eloquently states, he smells like phys ed. So you could say that Sloth had a lot going against him, but here's the really cool thing about it. Chunk didn't care. Chunk just wanted to be his friend, and he invited Sloth into the group of Goonies to be their friend. And there's a really cool, there's, there's a great lesson here for life about having a heart, right? And that we should include everybody in our lives and everybody in our activities. There's also a workplace lesson here. And it's because what Sloth did for the group of Goonies is he actually gave them the, the ability to get to that treasure, something they wouldn't have been able to do without Sloth. And ultimately our companies and our relationships are stronger when we embrace everyone, regardless of their cone-shaped heads, their odd looking ears that wiggle or the fact that they may just smell like phys ed. And the, the goal here, of course, with a business, if we think about this in the context of our business, including everyone is very important from a business perspective, because that person that you're, that is over in the corner, or maybe that we're not including in a team meeting, that person could have the solution to the problem that the business is facing. Oftentimes in our businesses and our workplaces, we look to the people with the titles, the right title to provide the solutions, but it's why sometimes our companies struggle so much and we get into that Flintstone car and we're moving our feet, but we're not going anywhere because we're not including everyone in the business to see if maybe that person who's been exclu excluded can be is included, can solve the problem. Case in point is Sloth. Sloth brought strength. He was a strong guy. He brought strength and heart and loyalty to the Goonies. And at the end of the Goonies, spoiler alert here, if you haven't seen it in a while, he helps them get to the treasure by using that strength and protecting them from the family of bandits so they can ultimately get to the treasure. And that was a loyal thing he did as well. So it's important from a business perspective to include everyone, but it's also important from a personal perspective. It's the right thing to do. It's the human thing to do, the good human thing to do, to include everyone. Now, my next movie here, uh, you know, I, I, I think, at least me, for me, I wanted to be this guy in high school. I probably thought I was this guy in high school. I was very far away from this guy in high school and that is Ferris Bueller. So Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now you see in this picture, again, I'll give you a little plot synopsis about the movie here. The three characters, we have Ferris in the front, the most optimistic, positive guy you could ever want to meet. Sloan, his girlfriend, as optimistic and positive as Ferris. And then we had Cameron, Mr. Negative as negative and pessimistic as they come. Ferris is taking his ninth day off of school and he prepares this day off. He does a lot of work to get ready so that he doesn't get busted. There's a lot of work that goes into it for he and Sloan. And he says at the beginning that Cameron, his friend, is wound up so tight that if he doesn't do something to loosen up, his college roommate when he gets to college is gonna kill him. So Ferris decides he's going to take Cameron on this day off. And he calls Cameron and says, you got it. You're going to come. And Cameron says, I can't, I'm dying. He doesn't want to get out of bed. He's just this negative guy. And Ferris says, I'm coming to get you. Be ready. And this idea from Ferris of life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. He really was trying to instill that in Cameron. And I have a story here about that. Actually, um, you may not like me after this story, uh, but in the late 1990s, I was working for an ad agency and we had a client who was pretty demanding. And he was demanding that we finish up a project two weeks before it was due out of nowhere on a Friday. Now I had moved to Florida from Baltimore. And remember in 1998, really very few people had cell phones. There was no texting to get a hold of somebody. And I was at work. My mom had flown in to see me after two years of me not being home or so flew in to see me to spend the weekend. We're going to meet at a restaurant for dinner at eight o'clock. Well, I'm stuck at work. Eight becomes nine, nine becomes 10, 10 becomes 10, 15, before this jerk finally shows up at the restaurant where my mom has been waiting, the most gentle, kind human being you could ever want to meet has been waiting two hours and 15 minutes for me to show up for our dinner. All because a client said, I want my project two weeks before it was actually due and I felt obligated to stay. Now, obviously our work is important and we want to make sure that we get things done for our clients. But ultimately, I learned a really valuable lesson about family here. 
And I promised that I would never do that to anybody that I ever loved again. And I haven't since. And my mom reminds me every time I see her. So when I meet her for dinner, I'm always 30 minutes early now. But this idea of life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it is a big thing. And it's one of the reasons that I'm doing what I do today because I did not want to miss my life doing something for someone else. I wanted to do it for me. And that's why I'm standing here. Now, this idea of work-life balance is a really important one. And Ferris teaches us that. In fact, in the workforce, Americans only take, only about 46% of Americans actually take their fully allotted vacation time, which is crazy. And here's the big thing there. The people who take their allotted vacation time get more promotions and more raises than the people who don't. Why? Because they're not burned out. They're taking a break. That stress that they feel at work, they're getting it off of their shoulders when they go relax, even if they don't go anywhere, even if you just go home for a few days and hang out with your family or by yourself or with your dog, like I would do. This, this idea that we don't take our vacation is really crazy. If it's there for you to take, that work-life balance is really important. Now, there's a bigger message here in Ferris Bueller. If you remember, I talked about his friend Cameron being the most negative person on earth and needing a day off. Ferris and Sloan took Cameron on this day off and they took a huge risk. All the work that they put into that day off could have been for naught because Cameron was so negative, he could have ruined the day. But Ferris felt it was so important for his friend Cameron to have a great day that he was willing to take that risk. And he taught us about the idea of all of us having this Cameron in our life, whether it's a workplace or a life Cameron. It's so important to find out what you can do to help them. So they may resist at first. Cameron resisted when Ferris said, look, I want to take you on this day off. But you should be persistent with them because more than likely they need it more than you do. And when we do something to help our friends, we help ourselves in the process. And in the movie, we see Cameron evolve. And by the end of the movie, the big struggle that he had in his life was really with his father and the difficulties and issues he was having with a very difficult and strict dad. And he decided to confront him. Now, it took them destroying his dad's Ferrari for him to decide that it was time to confront his father. But ultimately, that's where he gets to by the end of this movie. And that was really what Cameron wanted to do. He want, I'm sorry, Ferris wanted to do. He wanted to put Cameron in a position where he could say, look, you can be your own person. You can be happy. You can sit down and have a conversation with your dad. And he took him on this day off, a really important day off for Cameron, more important than Ferris. Although Ferris got to do some pretty cool stuff like sing in a parade, uh, impersonate Abe Froman, the sausage king of Chicago, to get his friends into a restaurant and catch a, a foul ball at a Cubs game. So ultimately Ferris and Cameron had a great day, or Ferris and Sloan had a great day too, but Cameron was the most important character in terms of making sure that he understood that life was about living. And that was a really important message that Ferris drove home with his friend Cameron. Now this next movie, uh, there is a sequel coming out, hopefully very soon. It got delayed because of COVID. I think it's gonna be coming out next summer. And uh, it had a couple of Saturday Night Live uh, cast members in the movie at the time. And that movie is Ghostbusters. And this is one of my favorites. And to this day, I believe it was Reebok just recently, either Reebok or Adidas, they just released a Ghostbusters shoe. To give you any idea of how Ghostbusters, we're now 36 years past the move when the move, first movie came out and they're still getting into our pockets with marketing. It's pretty amazing where this movie has gone. And if, by the way, if you have Netflix, there's a great documentary, The Movies That Made Us. And they go behind the scenes with some of the movies and one of them is Ghostbusters. And it's a really cool look at how the movie was made. So I highly recommend that one. Now our four Ghostbusters here, you know, these guys, three of the four actually lost their jobs as professors. And when they lost their jobs, they didn't know what to do because they had always worked in a university environment. They'd never actually been on their own trying to generate some business, but they became quickly became entrepreneurs. And they added a fourth Ghostbuster, Winston Zeddemore, who has one of the classic lines in the movie where he says, when somebody asks you if you're a god, you say yes. And so uh, that was towards the end of the movie. It's a very awesome scene. Now, the four of these Ghostbusters, nobody has really tested out their equipment. There's ghosts that are all over New York City. No one really wants to know, but these guys are going to try to solve that problem. They are gonna be the busters of ghosts. However, they haven't tried out their equipment yet. And there's a big problem for that. Beyond the fact that they don't know if they're actually gonna be able to capture these ghosts, they actually have unlicensed nuclear accelerators on their back. 
And at one point when they're up in the, they're in the hotel for their very first chance at trying to catch a ghost and they have this conversation and they say, you know, one of them says, why worry? Each one of us is carrying an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back as if to say, hey, this is no big deal. Let's just go do this. Now, obviously he was being sarcastic. He probably was very nervous, but this idea of taking risks in our life and in our workplace, you absolutely 100% cannot grow without risk, not your organization and certainly not yourself. And I am someone who took a lot of risk. I left a high paying, stable, secure corporate job at 48 years old and just threw caution to the wind, so to speak. And I went for it. And I love that I took that risk. And every day I tell people, what it's, what's it like to be an entrepreneur? Because this is how it was for the Ghostbusters. It's, it's, it's exciting and terrifying all in one day. And I kind of point back because I go back to the 80s. 1983, I'm 13 years old. Every entrepreneur day has the excitement of me throwing all my football pads, running out onto the field, hitting someone and getting hit, and then actually being able to get up because I think if I did that today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up. I'd probably be like a baby elephant trying to roll around off of my back to get stand up versus the horror and the terrifying moments of asking a girl to dance for the first time. So if you take those two feelings that I had when I was 13 years old, that is me every single day in this entrepreneur journey. And that's the idea of taking risks. It's awesome. I have grown so much in the last couple of years. I've done things I never thought I would be able to do. And it's all because I took a risk. And it's never too late, never too late, as Johnny Cade said, it's never too late to take those risks because you cannot grow without it. Now, I wouldn't say strap an unlicensed nuclear accelerator to your back, but if you did and you were the Ghostbusters, you would be, you would have enough money to go ahead and go to a hospital and get rid of those severe nuclear burns because you'd be doing just fine in your entrepreneur career as a Ghostbuster. Now, I talked about the mixtape quiz and here it is. So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to give you four clues from an 80s movie. And as soon as you know the name of the movie, what you wanna do is type it in to Faith and let her know that you know the name of the movie. And then as I said, somebody will get a signed book for me. It's worth a dollar less on the street, but it's a signed book. So, and it's right around the holidays. So it's a good gift. I, I think you'll enjoy it. So here we go. I'm gonna put four clues up. As soon as you know the name of the movie, you wanna type it into Faith. You ready? Here we go. The main character is mistaken for Calvin Klein. 1.21 gigawatts. Doc Brown. We already have some answers and, coming in. And hello, McFly. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is Back to the Future. Yes, correct. Fantastic movie, timeless, timeless, timeless movie. And the, the first person to reply was Chris D. All right, congratulations, Chris. Okay, I'll you're the winner, Chris. The book to you. <laughs> yep, Chris and Chris, that's awesome. Chris D and Chris D. So, uh, also, for those of you, obviously, if you know, if you ever, if you were around watching the sitcom Taxi in the 70s, Doc Brown, right, Christopher Lloyd played Reverend Jim, which is still, I still remember watching that with my dad as a young kid and, and just loving that character of uh, Reverend Jim. And I was lucky enough to have a chance to meet him at that event that I mentioned at the beginning of the year. And it was a really, really, really cool moment for me. So I mentioned the beginning of my presentation, the title is Wax On, Wax Off. So, of course, we're going to have a, a lesson from the Karate Kid. Now, again, just as a reminder with the Karate Kid, here we have Mr. Miyagi and Daniel, and Daniel's new in town. He obviously, he gets bullied. Now, there's some disagreement online about whether he was the bully as we look back or whether he was actually bullied. And if you're wondering about that, I would highly recommend, if you have Netflix, to watch the series Cobra Kai. It's the hottest show on Netflix right now. There's two seasons. The third one is coming in January. And it actually follows the, 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 the kids from Karate Kid, Daniel, Daniel and, um, da sorry, Daniel LaRussa and Johnny, the two that fought at the end, 40 years later, 35 years later. So it's a sequel. It's actually a sequel to The Karate Kid. And it has Ralph Macchio and all of the characters from the original Karate Kid, minus, unfortunately, Mr. Miyagi, because we lost him a few years ago. But it's really, really awesome how they kind of took that story and said, where would these guys be today in 2018, 2019, and 2020? Really good, highly recommend it. And it does make you question whether Daniel was actually the bully or not. But for our lesson, he's not. 
He's the kid who's getting bullied. Mr. Miyagi's the one who steps in and says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you martial arts, but not so that you can fight first. It's actually about fighting last, but it's about discipline and patience and a lot of other great qualities that we should have as human beings. Now, we all know that the wax on, wax off. But he also said, don't forget to breathe, very important. And he was, said this to Daniel when he was teaching him about the wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe, very important. And you know, I'm lucky that it's an involuntary uh, thing that we do because we do it 17,000 to 30,000 times a day. And if I had to think about it, I probably wouldn't be talking to you guys right now. So I'm really glad that it's actually an involuntary process in our bodies, but it is important. Don't forget to breathe, very important. And what he meant by this for Daniel was to relax and make sure that he was getting everything right. Make sure that you have the right form, the right discipline, and that you're patient when you're doing things. And those are all very, very important. But there's another thing, to, there's another aspect of this. The idea of breathe, it can be defined a lot of different ways when we talk about stress. And so this idea that stress is like dehydration, once you realize you have it, it's too late. And how important it is to breathe every single day. And that breathing could be taking a break and walking your dog, playing with your kids, watching television, exercising, taking, uh, having a cup of tea, whatever, however you define breathe, when you feel that stress building up, it is time to take a step back and breathe. Because if you've ever had dehydration, and I have, it is an awful, awful feeling. And it takes several days to recover from it physically and mentally. And the same goes for stress. We may not realize it in the same way. The physical signs of stress may not hit us the same way as dehydration, but it takes you a few days to actually move on from a really stressful situation. And it's so important to take a step back and breathe. And if you're a boss or a manager or a team leader or owner of a company and you have a team, it's also important for you to realize when your employees need to breathe. Because if you give them that room to do it, you'll create loyal employees who will stay with your business longer than they may have if they feel like there's constant pressure on them all the time. It's also your job to understand when it's time for your employees to take that breath, take a step back, because if they get stressed out, they're not going to be as productive and they're also not going to stick right. around to work with you as long as they would have had you given them that chance to breathe. So really great lesson from Mr. Miyagi. Now as we move in, and by the way, this is my, my shirt. If you can see it, that's the old karate kid. I'll get it right, right up close and personal with you right here. That's the old karate kid. And uh, these guys, four of the five guys are actually in the new Cobra Kai movie, so our Co Cobra Kai show. So well worth the watch. Now this next one is the musician that I mentioned to you. And this is one of my favorite movies. I, I mean, favorite lessons of all time. I get excited about all these lessons, but this one right here for me is one of the most exciting that I talk about. And that is Prince and Suzanne Vega. Now, Prince, in 1987, he was the king of music. He was doing everything, playing instruments, composing, singing, entertaining us all of the time. Top 10 hits, top five hits, number one hits, and writing music for people like the Bangles. If you ever heard the song Manic Monday, Prince wrote Manic Monday. Prince wrote Nothing Compares to You for Sinead O'Connor. So he was out there doing a lot of different things in 1987. He was the king of music. We talk about Michael Jackson being the king of pop and he can have that moniker. Prince was the king of music. And he, Suzanne Vega was an alt singer in 1987. Now she had a song called Left of Center. And then she came out with a song, My Name is Luca. I live on the second floor, I live upstairs from you. That's as much as you're gonna get out of me with singing, I'm not doing it. Maybe in a karaoke bar after a few beers, but that's about it. That's as, good you're gonna get, as much singing as you're gonna get from me. But Suzanne Vega, now she had the song, My Name is Luke, and it's a very serious song about child abuse and a, and a child that she was hearing abused above her. And it became a really popular song. And Prince heard it. Now, Suzanne Vega at the time was just, she had only had one song that people had really paid attention to. And now here was Prince saying, wow, this is an amazing song. He was so impressed that he penned this handwritten note to Suzanne Vega. And it says, dear Suzanne, Luca is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. Now, this is pretty cool. There's a lot to unpack in this handwritten note. First of all, the magical handwriting. I mean, just absolutely magical. And then he used words. He used numbers for words. 
well before we were doing it with texting. So I also wonder if he was maybe a futurist, who knows, or a time traveler, and just add that to his resume. Now, he got this handwritten note to Suzanne Vega. Remember in 1987, no digital means to get this note to her. No social media, no email. This had to be delivered to her, either hand delivered, put in the mail, somehow, some way, he was able to get it to her. And how do we know this? Because when, Su when, when Prince died in 2016, Suzanne Vega put this out on her social media to let people know the kind of guy that Prince was behind the scenes. We all knew him as the entertainer, but we didn't know this about him. We didn't know the human side of him and what he did for a singer that was up and coming. And do you think that this gave her a boost of self-confidence to receive this handwritten note from Prince in 1987, who said, hey, I see you, Suzanne. I see you doing something great. And I want to let you know to keep it up. That's a great song that you had. You're doing great things. And what he teaches us is the difference between those that rule and those that lead. That leaders share the stage of success when they get it. Rulers, when they get the stage of success, they tend to keep everybody below it. Leaders share the stage. They encourage others. They're not afraid to bring people up on that stage when they're doing something great and say, hey, I want to share this with you. I want to let you know that you're doing something great. And it's also about encouragement. The idea that encouragement doesn't cost a thing, right? It's free to encourage somebody. It doesn't cost you a thing. And as a leader, as somebody in the workplace, maybe a, a business owner yourself, you have employees, sometimes you can't give a raise, you can't give a bonus or a promotion just because at that moment, you really can't do it. But you can always give encouragement. And right now with all of us at home and people working from home who have never done that before, they're feeling scared. Maybe they're not sure about their job. They miss the camaraderie of being around people that they enjoy at work. And a handwritten note from one of their other team members or from a leader, a team leader that says, hey, I see you doing great stuff, keep it up. And they get that in their mail, it doesn't cost you a thing. And it's and it is a great feeling to feel encouraged. So I would say, remember, encouragement doesn't cost a thing. Prince taught us that. And this taught us what you can do when you're in a position to make, to let people know that you see them doing something great because we all need that. We all need that encouragement. Now you kind of saw, I accidentally hit my, my uh, remote here. You kind of saw the next movie that's coming. And again, by the way, if you've wondered if 80s pop culture is gonna burn out at any time soon because it's, it's had this kind of wave of popularity, it's not. And there's a number of reasons for it. Top Gun has a sequel coming out uh, summer of this year with Tom Cruise, with Val Kilmer, I don't know if they'll be reenacting their volleyball scene, but it'll be a, a uh, I'm sorry, a sequel to Top, Top Gun. There's a sequel, as I said, to Ghostbusters coming out. Also, if you just saw the news the other day, breakdancing is going to be an Olympic sport in 2024. So I think 80s pop culture is here to stay, including the sequel to this movie that's coming out in March, coming to America. There's a sequel coming out in March with the same people, Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, James Earl Jones, the whole cast is back together to entertain us once again. Now, if you never saw Coming to America, it's a great story about Prince Akeem, played by Eddie Murphy, and his best friend, Simi, played by Arsenio Hall. Now, Pr Prince Akeem is born into royalty in his fictional country of Zamunda. And because he's in royalty, everybody just wants to please him. That's all they want to do. In fact, there's a scene near the beginning of the movie where he's talking to a potential bride in his country and he's, he wants to know about her. Hey, what do you, what kind of music do you like? Whatever music you like, what kind of food do you like? Whatever food you like, on and on and on. And he's frustrated by this because this isn't what he wants. He actually wants to be with somebody who's independent, who's their own person and who really loves him for him or re and respects him for his leadership position because he's earned it, not because he was a, a prince by birth which is a really valuable lesson that we're gonna get into here. Now, Coming to America did exactly what it needed to do for me when I was 18 years old. And when I go back to the idea of lessons coming from unusual places, when I was 18 and I saw Coming to America, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It made me laugh out loud over and over and over again. Now, as a 50-year-old, it does something very different for me. It's teaching me valuable lessons about the workplace. And when Prince Akeem had this little throwaway line, now remember they flew, they went from Zamunda to Queens, New York, so he could find his queen in America. And he took a job at a fast food restaurant called McDowell's and he took an entry level job. 
Now, for those of you that haven't seen the movie in a while, they're actually Samuel L. Jackson and Cuba Gooding Jr. have two really small roles in it. So when you go back and you watch the movie again, you'll see those two uh, kind of cutting their teeth in their acting careers. And, and obviously Samuel L. Jackson did phenomenally well after that. So he's working as an entry level, an entry level job in a fast food restaurant. And he says, when you think of garbage, think of Akeem. Kind of a throwaway line in the movie, but a really important line about our lesson here. Now, when, as I mentioned, when he was in Zamunda, he was a prince and he had, he had not earned that position of leadership. It was just handed to him. It was unearned leadership, if you will. And he wanted to earn his way, earn respect. And so what he taught us was unearned leadership creates pleasers while earned leadership creates believers. And this idea that because he was born into royalty that everybody should just respect him. Well, when you, when you haven't earned your leadership position, a lot of times what you do is you create pleasers. Everybody just wants to please you because they don't know how to act around you because most of the time when you've been given a position, you haven't earned it, you don't know how to act as a leader either. Or they're scared. They're scared of the person and they just want to please them. When you've earned your leadership position, you create believers for two reasons. One is people see your track record and they're like, track record, they're like wow, I'm going to listen to this person because clearly they have earned this leadership position. They know what they're talking about. They can maybe help me along the way. I, they, they've earned my respect and they've earned their leadership position. In your business, if the people who are in leadership positions have earned those positions, then people who are starting out in your business or maybe people that are coming on board can see that and say, hey, there's an opportunity here for me to earn my way up that ladder within the business or the company, rather than seeing people who are just kind of positioned there and thinking, well, there's no way that I can get into that position because those people were all kind of handed those titles and handed those positions. So it's really important for people in your business to see that everyone at the leadership position has earned that position and you will create believers and you'll create a really awesome workplace culture environment where you'll keep people longer, which of course saves the business money. And you're doing the right thing from a human perspective because people want to earn their position. And if they've earned their position, they're going to respect the people, not just above them, but they're going to respect the people below them as well. And that's really what you want. More importantly, you want leaders who respect the people that work below them, with them, on their team, even more so than respecting the people above them. So this is a really important lesson. Unearned leadership creates pleasers. Earned leadership creates believers. Now I'm going to show you a picture here and you're going to see a bunch of guys. You're, you're going to recognize a few of them. And it was a long time ago, 1983. And it's the Outsiders. And here we have Emilio Estevez, Rob Lowe, C. Thomas Howe, Matt Dillon, Ralph Macchio, my man crush Patrick Swayze, and Tom Cruise pre-dental work. If you can see that picture clearly, you can see those are not the teeth that he has today. So uh, The Outsiders was a movie in 1983. Now the really cool story behind The Outsiders is it was written by a 15 and a half, 16 year old girl named Essie Hinton back in 1967. She wrote the great American novel at 16 years old, 15 and a half years old in 1967. And here's the really awkward part of that. Her name is Susan Eloise Hinton. And the publisher said, boys aren't going to want to read a book about boys written by a girl. And they requested that she change her name. So in 1967, she changed her name to S.E. Hinton. And she kept it because the success of The Outsiders, her name became so popular that she then wrote Rumble, Rumble Fish and a few other uh, story books as well, but never really brought that name back, S. E. Susan Eloise Hinton. And I think that's a really, that shows you how far we've come that she couldn't even keep her own name. Now, a lot of authors will use pen names for different reasons. Stephen King does it when he's writing certain books. A lot of authors have pen names. Mark Twain was a pen name. But for in her situation, this was not a pen name. This was actually because she was told by the publisher that boys wouldn't read the book written by boys or about boys written by a girl. Pretty crazy. And I'm glad that we're way past that, but it is a really cool story for the background of The Outsiders. And if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. It is a timeless piece from 1967. And it's about two gangs, the Greasers here and the Sochas. The greasers from the wrong side of the track, the socials from the right side of the tracks, and they fight over things like territory and girls in high school. That's the kind of typical gang fights you would have in Oklahoma back in the, they say the mid 60s is basically when it was set. Now I want to point out one thing about Patrick Swayze. Now I love Patrick Swayze and of course he was a huge 80s star. 
And Patrick Swayze, I'm sorry, I know like that thing's in the way there a little bit. So let me just move it down here and that might be better. Now you can really see Patrick Swayze. Now Patrick Swayze was a huge 80s star and I love all of his movies. But there is one movie that I haven't seen by him. And actually when they remake his movies, I get really upset because I feel like they should just be in a time capsule and keep them the way they are. There's one movie that I haven't seen that Patrick Swayze was in. If you can guess what it is, you'll probably be very upset with me if you also like Patrick Swayze and you like 80s movies. And that movie is Dirty Dancing. I have never seen Dirty Dancing. And um, there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the main reasons is that I graduated high school in 1988 and our senior prom theme was now I had the time of my life, which was the song from Dirty Dancing. I wanted Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home, not exactly a senior prom song, so I lost out. And I had the time of my life, I had to hear this song 150 times that night. It was seared into my brain. All of the glassware, all of the favors that we had, we got said, now I had the time of my life. I have night terrors about that song. To give you a little bit of insight into me, I have night terrors about that song. I could never watch this movie now. The same way that I used to work at Disney, and when I worked at Disney, I brought some friends in. I don't know why we decided to go on the It's a Small World ride, but we did. And of course it broke down in the middle of it. And if you've been on that ride, we were legitimately stuck inside the ride. And the only thing that was working were the dolls singing, now I had the time of my life. You wanna talk, I'm sorry, singing It's a Small World. You wanna talk about creepy? All these little dolls singing It's a Small World while we're sitting there and, the, and the, the boat's not moving and we're thinking, please get us out of here. We're in this dark tunnel. We have nowhere to go. And these dolls are singing It's a Small World to us. So now you know a little about me. I, I have night terrors about, now I had the time of my life, Dirty Dancing, and I have night terrors about It's a Small World. Oh, and, and the two movies that I really cry every time I watch are E.T. about an alien and Cast Away when the volleyball floats away. Wilson, I cried because I missed the volleyball. I don't know. That's just me, I guess. If anybody, if nobody else, we can we can move on from that if no one else has cried for Wilson the volleyball, but I did. And I, I, I'm not afraid of it. I've done it several times. So back to the movie, The Outsiders. We're gonna focus on two characters here for the movie. And let's get this in here. One second, I have a little technical difficulty. There we go. Johnny Cade and Pony Boy. Now, Johnny Cade, Pony Boy is played by C. Thomas Howe. Johnny Cade by Ralph Macchio. Now, Johnny Cade is the typical kid that would join a gang. He's got a rough life, a violent life. He ends up in the gang. Pony Boy comes to the gang for a family that he really doesn't have. And he's very naive, he's very innocent. And Johnny, and Johnny Cade recognizes this in him. And he embraces him and he takes care of him and he protects him. And at one point in the movie, the two of them are fighting Soches. And Johnny Cade stabs a Soche and the Soche is going to die. So now these two have to go on the run from the police and they hole up in an abandoned church and they go out one day to get something to eat. They come back and the church is on fire and there are kids stuck inside the church. And Johnny Cade says, I'm gonna do something right in my life for the very first time. And he runs into the church and he saves these kids from this burning church. But in the process, he's severely burned and he's going to die. Now he's in the hospital and Pony Boy comes to visit him and he pens this note to Pony Boy, which is really, really awesome. It's a really great note. In the note, he says a lot of things, including you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. But he also says, stay gold. Now, for those of you that, are, that love poetry like me, Robert Frost wrote a poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay. And it's a great poem. It won't take much of your time to read. It's about birth, life, death, rebirth. Nothing gold can stay is the name of the poem. Stay gold, there's a lot of nothing gold can stay in the outsiders and stay gold is one piece of it. Johnny Cade says the pony boy stay gold and what he's saying basically is stay who you are, don't change. Don't let the gang influence you. Don't let our lifestyle influence you. Get out of this and continue to be who you are. In fact, bring some of the other guys along with you because they need to see what life is really like. They need to see that there's something more than the gang. And what he taught us here was that true leaders and humans will keep their ethical and moral compass intact even sacrificing themselves to ensure that their team, business employees, or family are protected from whatever is daily in the workplace or family dynamic. This is a really important thing about staying gold. And in the workplace, when we see things happen in an organization, something bad happens, and leaders tend to get into this circular firing squad. They all start pointing fingers at everybody else. Nobody stands up and says, hey, I'm a leader. This is my responsibility. A lot of times we see everybody pointing fingers. 
But there is that one person who typically stays gold and protects the workplace, protects the people inside of that workplace. Now, if you're a leader and there's a situation that arises, it's very easy to be a leader when things are going well. Anybody can do it when things are going well. Leaders are there for when things are going poorly, when there's a huge problem, a bad situation. That's why leaders are there. They're the ones that are supposed to lead us through. And so more people need to start doing that in terms of like a staying gold. And if you're a leader, people aren't going to remember, your team members are not going to remember the times that things were going well and had you, how you acted. They're gonna remember what you did when the chips were down. That is going to be your legacy. And when they move on to other companies or they become leaders themselves, when people ask them about their time underneath your leadership, that's what they're gonna remember, how you acted when the chips were down. So this is your chance to create your legacy and stay gold. When everybody else around you is pointing fingers, circular firing squad, take responsibility, step up, stay gold. It will benefit you in the long run. And by the way, it benefits the people who are around you as well, whether they're family members and it's a family dynamic or it's a company and you're the one that needs to step up and take responsibility. You're protecting people who cannot protect themselves. The people that work for you are more vulnerable than you are. Some family members are more vulnerable than you are. Step up and protect those people. Stay gold. Really important lesson from a Soch, the wrong side of the tracks. I'm sorry, from a greaser, the wrong side of the tracks. Now, as we wrap up here, I have one more lesson for you. And this guy, now there are only two times in my life where somebody that I loved watching on the big screen passed away and I really did feel something. I was upset. I, I, I knew that I was gonna miss the opportunity to see them on screen again. And every time I see them, I just smile because they make me feel good. And the first one was John Candy. When John Candy passed away, if you ever saw the movie Planes, Trains and Automobiles, he played a character, Del Griffith, and I never met the guy, but I wanna believe and assume that so much of the great character that was Del Griffith was actually the real John Candy. And I really miss John Candy a lot. I also miss this guy. Robin Williams. He was fantastic. And we lost him way too young. If you think about all of the movies that he did and all of the entertaining he did for all of us, from Mork and Mindy on up to this movie and beyond, Dead Poet Society. Dead Poet Society is a fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, just be prepared. This is not the kind of movie where you're gonna, when the movie's over, you're gonna be jumping for joy and you're gonna wanna go out dancing. This is a movie that is going to make you think and is going to make you feel. And Robin Williams plays John Keating, who's a private school teacher at a school where the kids have been taught, very wealthy, prestigious school. The kids have been taught to stay in line, stay in between the lines. This is where you are, this is what you do. You're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an attorney, you're going to be an engineer. This is it, this is your life. And Robin Williams' character, John Keating, just believes there's more to life than just listening to what everybody's telling you. And he's a little bit radical in his teachings and he uses poetry to teach the kids and he stands up on his desk like he's doing here. And he uses a lot of great poetry. You wanna talk about a, a movie that refers to a lot of poems, this is the one. Now, if you know the movie Dead Poet Society, then you probably know Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. That's what really came out of this movie. People always say Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. And it was something where it was a great scene where he has the kids and he's showing them a trophy case in the school. And he's showing them all the pictures and they're all looking at the pictures of the football teams and the soccer teams and the rugby teams from 1905 all the way up to these when these kids were in 1989. And he's saying, can you hear them? Can you hear them telling you Carpe Diem, Seize the Day? The idea that they were once here too, and now they're not. And this is your opportunity to seize the day, carpe diem. Great line, but there's a better one. And it's really important for today. And this is the line that he said to them, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Now, when I was growing up in the eighties, for me to get my words and ideas out, there weren't a whole lot of ways for me to do it. I had my local newspaper, the Community Times, which probably got to 50 people in my neighborhood. Not exactly the place where my words and ideas could change the world and get out to the globe and to all the people that I wanted to hear my words and ideas. It's different today. Today, we have access to so many ways to get our words and ideas, just social media alone. If you have something to say, you have something positive to say, you believe that you have an idea or words that can change the world or even just change one person, you can do it today. That idea that words and ideas can change the world is a real thing today. 
And we should all embrace that and take advantage of it. Because those, there are people now that you will never meet. And you don't have to be a movie producer or a journalist or a politician, a world leader, an actor, an author. You don't have to be anybody who is out there talking to people. You can just be you and share your words and ideas with the world through so many different channels nowadays that if you have something to say, say it. And I'll end with that. I thank you so much. Um, again, Chris Clues, these are my books, what 80s pop culture teaches us about today's workplace. They are available on Amazon and print and Kindle. And I'll point out one other thing. I wrote a short story called Coffee, Love and a Cross Country Road Trip. It's only about 70 pages. Um, it's about a guy, uh, you can guess who it is, that falls in love for the first time in his life at 49 years old and had never felt that feeling before and then goes on a big road trip during COVID. So it's a fun little book. It's very different from these two. I am working on a third right now that focuses on what 80s pop culture can teach us about life as well. So I'm adding that book to the series, hopefully this fall coming up. So I wanna thank you again for the megaphone. I really enjoyed it. Uh, congratulations, Chris D for the book. 